Hello, Booktube. It's a beautiful day here in Boston. Beautiful autumn day, bright skies, cool, crisp. Uh, and I went to the Brattle Bookshop uh, this morning. Those of you who are uh, who are new to the channel, there are quite a few of you, and I can't help but notice. <laughs> Thank you for showing up and welcome. Uh, the Brattle Bookshop is an old secondhand bookshop here in Boston. Uh, it's three stories of reasonably placed and very very broad ranging books on every subject under the sun. Uh, and in addition to that, that already describes a perfectly good used bookstore. But in addition to that, the Brattle also has the, they also own the lot next door where ordinarily another building would be. And the lot is entirely full of sale books, $1, $3 and $5 sale books. Uh, and they're usually really, really good. The, the stock that's out there is usually excellent. It's not it, often you'll see used bookstores, will have outdoor sale carts of one kind or another, and that's where they put the junk. That's where they put the stuff that is falling apart or is mildewed or whatever, and that they can't put inside the shop. The Brattle tends not to do that. You will usually, when you're out there, find only books that look perfectly fine. They just, for one reason or another, don't go inside. Uh, I've noticed. I noticed that today, maybe that wasn't quite so universally true. I noticed a few water warped and waterlogged books, but only because. It takes time to get those carts in out of the rain, and we've had pop-up rainstorms for the last few days. So probably it's just that those books were caught out in the rain. <laughs> uh, but one way or another, I had I had the opportunity to go. I don't. I used to go to the Brattle every day. I don't anymore. I had the opportunity to go, and I took it. And as a result, I have a small stack of books I want to show you, <laughs> which does not in any way invalidate my goal to decrease my number of books. <laughs> doesn't in, in, in any way invalidate that. When you're talking about a place as cheap as the Brattle, cheap or free, often I have store credit, so I'll, I'll, or it's either cheap or it's free, and so is everywhere else I go to get secondhand books. I don't pay money, real money, for secondhand books. Never. Uh, it, I just, I, especially now, I can't justify it with getting books in the mail every day. Uh, but the key thing to understand if you, too, want to decrease the number of books in your possession, the key isn't how many you take in. The key is how many you get rid of. If I take in, what, what do I have here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven books. I got seven books at the Brattle today uh, for $10. And uh, of these seven books, I will probably keep one, maybe two. And when they go on the discard, when the others go on the discard pile, they will go with lots and lots of other books. <laughs> that's my, that's what I'm telling myself anyway, that I'm balancing this out and more by getting rid of books and not really restricting what I want. So I, when the books are cheap and plentiful and they're all, and there are all kinds of subjects, then I just scoop them up and I, then I determine what I, what I want to keep. Uh, so I want to show you these books and they start off with uh, fiction. Uh, including this, The Rags of Time by Maureen Howard. This is a novel of hers. There's the Bethesda Fountain in, in Central Park. Uh, uh, this is a novel of hers about an old writer who's looking back on her life, and I haven't read it since it first came out, uh, which was uh, 2009, quite some time ago. And uh, when I saw it, I, at the Brattle today, I realized that I, there were parts of it that I really liked. And now I'm wondering if maybe I would like a lot more. It's it's a beautiful hardcover, so so I grabbed it when I will I will work it into my fiction reading time. Then the other two uh, works of fiction here are books that likewise I have also read, and uh, unlike uh, 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 this one, the the Rags of Time, I remember uh, liking parts of it, but not being bowled over by it. And when I saw it today, I thought that I had that that twinge in the back of your mind where you think maybe that was better than I thought. Uh, maybe I should revisit it. Uh, with these other two, I was bold away. I loved them both. And uh, and so when I saw, you know, mint condition, perfect paperbacks of them, I grabbed them. Uh, one of them I have not at all. I don't have a copy of it until now anymore. I've had copies in the past. I always give it away. And the other one, I have a hardcover, but I, I'll for, for a dollar I'll take an, an extra paperback. Uh, and the the first one is uh, Dissolution by C.J. Sansom. This is a, a novel of Tudor England. This is a novel of, uh, starring Matthew Shardlake, who is a, a lawyer in London. He has uh, 
a dogged curiosity. He has an affable personality, and he has a hunchback. Uh, and he works in the courts of of uh, of Tudor England, and is inevitably in this first book caught up in uh, affairs of state, in in the mechanisms of the government. In in fact, as you can tell from the title, the dissolution of the monasteries uh, and a murder that takes place in in one such place. And it's it's terrific. All of the Matthew Shard Lake books are so good, and they get much longer. By the, the by, the time this series really gets going, they're four times the size of this of this debut. They become big, sumptuous historical novels on their own. And I've heard a rumor that a new book in the series is coming out in 2019. Further proof in my mind that 2019 may be a really good year for historical fiction. Uh, so that rumor, plus the fact that I don't have any of these books, and I love historical murder mysteries, absolutely love them. Uh, Made me grab this as soon as I saw it, and uh, and the other one likewise has a a modern contemporary spur to it. This is John Ray's novel Low Boy, about a, a young man who's severely uh, chemically imbalanced and is at loose in the city, and his mother is desperately trying to find him, and she enlists the aid of a policeman, uh, and it's it's incredible. The, the narrative from their point of view, from Low Boy's point of view, it's incredible. Just amazing. One of the most affecting uh, portrayals of mental illness that I have ever read in fiction. Uh, and the reason, I, I have a hardcover for this, but the reason that I got the paperback, uh, in addition to the fact that it was, you know, it was a dollar, and that I, people ask me many times, do you have a piece of contemporary fiction that you could recommend? When somebody asks me that, I like to not only recommend the book, but give it to them. That way I figure I've done everything I can. <laughs> if I sing the book's praises and I recommend it, and I also hand you a copy, then I've done all that I can. <laughs> For I'm not going to check up and say, did you read it? Here are ten questions. Uh, now, I admit, uh, this is a violation of one of, of, of a, what should be a basic rule. In book acquisition and in the new year, it's going to have to be a hard and fast rule, which is that you don't get a double. Period. Unless you have an intended recipient in mind, and I don't. Unless you do, then it doesn't matter if you see it for a dollar. You don't get it. Uh, I, I've spent a lifetime doing the opposite. I've spent a lifetime seeing cheap books, uh, copies of books that I really like, and grabbing them under the assumption that down the line I will want to give them at the spur of the moment to someone else. And that happens, but it doesn't happen as often as the purchases do, which means you end up with a huge amount of books, a huge amount of redundant books. Uh, but the reason that I got this, in addition to that, in addition to wanting to share it with somebody, uh, was that uh, I just reread, I just finished my reading of the finished copy of John Ray's new book, God Sent, which is amazing. It's, in, it's incredibly good. Um, and uh, so this was on my mind, as, including uh, for the dumb reason that it has the same cover artist, same cover design. Uh, so I, I grabbed a piece of fiction that I already have, and I will read this paperback. I will, I've been meaning to reread Low Voice since I read God Send the first time, much less the second time. So I will, I will reread this. I will make use of it, but I, uh, either, either it or the hardcover will go. <laughs> they won't both stay. Uh, and then uh, the next one is an anthology. It's in a little rough shape. I don't, I don't plan on keeping it. I will just read the stuff in here. Uh, that I haven't read, and also reread re the stuff that I have. This is a, a book of sea journeys, uh, compiled by Ludovic Kennedy. Uh, and the thing that grabbed my eye was the Jacques Tissot painting on the cover, since he is one of my favorite painters. No one knows any. No one knows any Victorian painters. They're they're viewed as the height of Keats. They're they're scorned by collectors and by serious art historians and whatnot. As far as I'm concerned, you could fill a museum with paintings like that. That is the this is this is a painting of the very last day on board a ship, a passenger ship. We have con uh, confirmed prejudices, positive and negative, written large on the faces of all the passengers as they're getting ready to to disembark. Uh, but as far as I'm concerned, you could f you could fill a museum with with late Victorian and Edwardian paintings like this and exclude the uh, formaldehyde sharks, the preserved toilets, the twenty-foot uh, canvases painted solid blue, uh, the the large white canvases covered in random 
throws of paint. The painter stood on the other side of the room and just threw paint at the canvas and dares to call it a finished work and charge money for it. And the museum dares to hang it so the people can file by and look at it. Instead of that, I would be perfectly happy with a museum that had only these things. But but I did not buy this just for the Tissot painting. I, 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 I'm a sucker for sea stories. I spent, I spent uh, more time on the oceans, on the water, the rivers and oceans of, of uh, this planet than I have on solid land, as far as I can tell, as far as I can estimate. Uh, and it's a little melancholy to think that those days are over. So a, a collection of sea stories was, was uh, always going to appeal. And I don't think I've ever seen this one. Probably it will have a lot of the same stuff, the usual suspects. Uh, but I don't mind. I'll see, I'll see what, what kind of collections, oddities, this editor brings to the mix. Uh, then the next one, I don't know if I can show you the... Uh, yes, I can. Okay. The next one is you're, it's going to strike you as a little strange. It is, this is the one-volume 9-11 commission report. This is the commission on... Uh, uh, by uh, detailing what happened on 9/11, on the terrorist attacks on 9/11, uh, and this is this is the one-volume paperback that that they made, and uh, you wouldn't think that I would get this at the Brattle. I read it when it first came out, and I have studied it in in, in exhaustive detail ever since. Not on on, a, on my own hook, but also because an old friend of mine was a conspiracy theorist uh, who late in his life moved from I mean with the thing if you're a conspiracy theorist then you doubt received opinion you doubt official stories and there's no such thing as a micro specialist <laughs> you can you can amass a huge amount of material on any conspiracy and people usually do uh, and this this friend of mine the his main focus was the Kennedy assassinations uh, but late in his life he moved on to to 9/11 certainly examined it with his with his usual rigor and, and there was a lot of conversation about this book uh but even so it's a government report and you wouldn't think that i would grab it from the brattle and the reason that i did is because of another book it's because of this thing a thousand books to read before you die by james mosters i uh, i've read this a few times through now i've poured over it and i am writing a review of it today uh and the 9 11 commission report is in this book <laughs> this is one of the thousand books that, that he wants you to read before you die. Uh, and in his description of it, he mentions a surprisingly atmospheric narrative and sophisticated storytelling techniques. And I think maybe that might be right. I was curious enough, especially since this was dirt cheap, I was curious enough to find out whether or not that's right. Uh, I could easily see, as with the... the, uh, the the, uh, here, we'll do all the visual prompts here. It's with the Maureen Howard book. As soon as that I saw that re that recommendation, that tingle went off in my head, and I thought, okay, well, it's, I could easily see it possible that when I read this, I was reading it for facts instead of that I was just turning a blind eye to its other qualities. It's possible that I missed those. And if they're there, they would interest me. Uh, so... I, the, I owe the getting of this book largely to the, the presence of another book. Not exactly a rarity. Uh, the next one is a big fat UK trade paperback. I love UK trade paperbacks. Uh, this is Paul Thomas Murphy shooting Victoria. A big thick uh, head of Zeus paperback. Uh, the American version didn't feel this satisfyingly plump in the hand. I think the American version might have been a little bit better looking in this rare instance. But this is his big book about the attempts on Queen Victoria's life. The, the men who leapt out of the crowd and tried to kill her. Uh, it happened, uh, you know, half a dozen more times in, in the early part of her reign. Uh, and the author not only finds all of those men, in the history books, it finds them in the archives and tells their stories. This is not just a book about the incidents themselves, it's about the men as well. He also tells the story of the the police response and the manhunts and the changes that it worked in the Metropolitan Police and ultimately the changes that it worked that it worked in the monarchy. Uh, and I loved it when it first came out and I didn't review it. I don't honestly know why. For some reason, I, I don't think I ever reviewed this book. Uh, and it's an odd thing. <laughs> it's an odd chemistry. Sometimes 
if I'm looking back at a previous year's pile of books and I see something that I liked and I think, ah, but you didn't review it, then I don't keep it, even though that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> it should be, did I like it enough to keep it? Would I go back to it? And uh, one of the reasons that I, I'm going to take great pleasure in rereading this is because I remember that to a very surprising extent, uh, this was a study of, the, of Victoria's reign. Not just a study of these men who wanted to bring it to an abrupt and premature end. Uh, and I, I uh, haven't read it in, in years. When did this uh, when did this come out? Uh, 2012. So I, I was overjoyed to find it. This is a history book I want to keep. This is a, especially a Victorian history book I want to keep. Uh, and then the last book that I got to rattle today, talk about a keeper. <laughs> this is the New Yorker Book of Dogs. <laughs> this is a, just a huge you might think that from that title that it's a, that it's just a huge collection of New Yorker dog cartoons and that's not true. They make a book like that and I have it. Uh, this is rather much more ambitious than that. This is a study of the New Yorker's uh, interaction with dogs. This has poetry, this has profiles, this has lots and lots of artwork, this has short stories. That are connected to, to dogs. This is this is everything. This is this is uh, far more ambitious than just uh, a big fat collection of dog cartoons. Not that I would have turned one down. If I'd seen a new big fat collection of dog cartoons, I would probably have grabbed it. Uh, but this is something more. I remember being impressed by how ambitious this was when it first came out. Which again, let's let's check here. <laughs> uh, this was, had to be ten years ago. No, two thousand twelve. Uh, I remember being impressed by it, and I had it, and I think I gave it away to a dog person, uh, and now I have it again, thanks to the brattle. <laughs> so, so that is it. That was my brattle trip this morning. We have the, the New Yorker Book of Dogs. We have Shooting Victoria. We have a book of sea journeys. Uh, we have the 9-11 Commission Report. We have The Rags of Time by Maureen Howard, a, a novel set in contemporary New York. We have Low Boy by John Ray, also set in contemporary New York. Uh, and we have Dissolution by C.J. Sampson, the first of his Matthew Shardlake mysteries set in Tudor England, uh, which, uh, if you haven't read them and you, you like historical murder mysteries, and especially Tudor history, uh, you should go to your library and <laughs> start with Dissolution. You're going to be very happy that you did. And the, the thing that I'm happy to report about the Shard Lake Mysteries is that they get better as they get longer. That's almost never true. Uh, but in this case, yeah. <laughs> in this case, yes. Uh, there are some, uh, some of the more recent ones are up at 500 page range. They are meant to be much more than just a whodunit. And they work out right, quite well that way. So <laughs> so it's a, we'll top that off with a recommendation as well. Uh, but that's it. That was my brattle trip uh, for this morning. So uh, probably plenty more bookish stuff to do today. <laughs> so you probably haven't seen the last of all this. <laughs> but I'll wrap this up for now. Uh, and I'll see you soon. Thank you, Book 2.